By the time this video gets uploaded, Arcane's Act 3 will have been out for a month, maybe a bit more, but I sincerely doubt that by the time this video is uploaded, people will have forgotten about the show. Arcane was revolutionary in many aspects, from making a video game adaptation that didn't actually feel out of place or way too on the nose, to reminding us that Imagine Dragons can actually make bangers, uh, Arcane was a big breath of fresh air. As a non-League of Legends player, you can imagine my pleasant surprise that all of my friends who have been raving about Arcane since its trailer were actually right in hedging their bets on the show being good. But before I get too serious, let me list a bunch of things I really liked, because like I said, by the time this video will have been uploaded, I have had a month's worth of brain rot for the show, and I need to get it out. Also, spoilers from this point forward. So, in no particular order, I love the character designs being simple but easy to read, feeling like Dishonored 1 and 2. Speaking of character designs, Bye. Just bye. Uh, this specifically surprisingly human expression on Jinx's face. Also Piltover's finest, Mel being a girl boss, Victor's hair before the time skip, Silco's hair, this weirdly realistic looking shot of the plants. The soundtrack, especially Paris just randomly showing up, they were out for me when they did that. Uh, this shot of Vi kneeing Savika in the face, this shot of Vi punching the chem soldiers, uh, Jinx's entire existence, and Savika's entire existence. There's plenty more, but that would detract from the point of the video. So. Arcane blew up, and to almost everyone's surprise, it didn't crash and burn like so many other video game adaptations or even origin stories so often do. Why is that? Well, to put it simply, Arcane is a new form of tragedy, and while we know how everything ends, what with Jinx and Vi being on opposing sides, watching everything fall into place and the relationship slip through their fingers is painfully satisfying. Now, some may think, how is this a tragedy? Well, to pull up a literary definition, tragedies in the Greek sense simply display the sad downfall of its protagonist due to a multitude of factors such as harmatia, failure or error, or peripatia, a reversal of fate. Yet, while the ancient Greeks such as Aristotle argued that characters were secondary to uh, the plot of a tragedy, Arcane simply spat in that idea's face. After all, the show's praise comes quite a bit from how human these characters feel. I mean, even the evil characters have good reason to act the way they do. And in this sense, those reasons aren't cheap like we come to see in modern sympathetic villains. Take, for example, Silco. While he does flood Zahn with drugs and turns into a capitalist hellscape for the ages, his care for Jenks stems from a familiarity with her. This familiarity, of course, is being the weaker of a pair that needed to claw their way out to survive. So, if Arcane is a modern tragedy whose focus remains on its characters, who does it focus on and why? Well, it's easy to make an argument that Vi and Jinx are the characters that are the focus of the series. I mean, they're used in pretty much every aspect of Arcane's promotion, and the summary of the series does quite literally mention them by name. However, I'm going to make the case that the show is Jinx's tragedy. After all, by the end of the show, she loses the most, and she is at the lowest point in her life since... Well... <laughs> I know, it took a bit of meandering to get to this point, but Jinx proves that Arcane is a tragedy. Her tragedy. Conveniently enough, as the show was released and structured in acts, it's quite easy to spot a pattern when it comes to Jinx. This show is about the three deaths and the three rebirths that Powder and later Jinx undergo. It's also great because there's some subtle symbolism used that you usually only take note of in the books that your high school teachers make you read. So, by the end of Act 1, Powder comes around the corner of the gravesite of her father and her brothers. It's raining, and that'll be a detail I come back to later. In the confrontational scene between Vi and Powder that follows, the first death occurs. It is when Vi quite literally smacks Powder across the face and calls her a jinx, the first in the series, and correct me if I'm wrong, the only time she ever refers to her sister as jinx. With Vi stepping back and unfortunately getting taken away, and Soko's discovery of Powder, this is the first metaphorical death that Powder undergoes. It sets her on an irreversible path under Soko's wing, with words that will be echoed later. It's okay. show them. We will show them all. The reason why I mentioned rain earlier is that often in literature, water and by extension rain are used to symbolize the washing away of things, in this case of the past. It is a symbolic method in which Silco is stripping powder of her past with Vander and company, and placing her into the world of Zahn and of violence. Similarly, by the end of Act 2, another death occurs for Jinx. It also occurs in the last episode of the act. I hope you're starting to see the pattern I do. 
Now, I will say that the baptism scene in, I believe, episode 5 was another reference to the symbology of water washing things away, and it helped Jinx go down this path. I actually uh, think I have a better case for this in another section. Jinx and Vi are reunited, and for a moment there's a glimmer of hope for Jinx. As they hug each other for the first time in years, Jinx drops the Hextech gem, another symbol of what ties her and Silco together through the, her obligation to him by building a weapon for it. The moment is truly touching, and even if you as a viewer know that this wouldn't last for long, the moment still mattered. I, I'll get back to this in another section, but the scene, much like every other scene in the show, not only was vital to the tragedy, but it felt vital too. Moments after the two hug, Jinx spots Caitlyn, a woman she views as Vi's replacement for her. It's tense because you know that Vi and Kate have already formed a pretty strong bond, and while you're rooting for them, you also understand why Jinx is on edge. She doesn't want to be replaceable to the people she loves, it's why she does what she does. As the scene progresses, Vi sees how much Jinx has changed, and by the end, the two sisters are separated again. These last few scenes were less about Jinx's past dying, though there were hints of that in her acknowledgement of how much Kate means to Vi, uh, but these scenes were more about how Vi's vision of Powder died. I mean, the woman slammed a machine gun into a poor guy several times without mercy. It's, it's safe to say that the old innocence that Powder once had is dead. Dead and gone. But Vi still hopes that it's there, and to an extent, it still is. Oh boy. We're on the act three death now. Uh, ignore me, I'm still very heartbroken over everything that happened in episode 9, and I'm just... Ah, uh, okay, 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 okay. This final death that Jinx has undergone was partially set up by the undoubtedly shimmer-induced treatment that Singe gave her in prior episodes, but it was also spurred by the actual death that happened in this episode. So, that hint of powder that Vi still saw, well, it was there. Although they had been separated for so long, and although Vi refused to shoot Kate to, quote, get powder back, Jinx still protected her sister. In a feat of shimmer-induced instincts, when Soko raises a gun to Vi, Jinx mows him down, only to realize what she had done. And Jinx's final death and rebirth happens with his final words. I never would have given you to them. Not for anything. Don't cry. You're perfect. Now, they're truly heartfelt. I mean, even if Silco was a horrible guy and maybe could have done quite a few things better when it came to Jinx, you could still tell that he loved her at least what he molded Jinx to be. He truly saw her as someone he cared for, even if this relationship was quite unhealthy. Flaws and all. But those words could not have come at a worse time, really, because with those words, Silco gives his fatherly stamp of approval to how perfect Jinx is. Not Powder. And although he does not mention Zod's imminent sovereignty, he alludes to its opposite by saying that he would have never given Jinx to them. So Jinx, in the wake of her father's death, is left to state that she's going to give a cheer to her and Vi's new selves by sending a giant magic missile from Fishbone's mouth at Piltover's council. By the end of the series, Powder, at least 99.999, you get my point, of her is dead due to these three deaths, and from the smoke and shimmer emerges Jinx. So, with this repetition of death after death, Jinx honestly ends up worse, and it's why the show is Jinx's tragedy over and over. She, or someone around her, destroys the old image of powder until all that's left are memories and a woman whose trauma was never given a chance to heal. It's a tragedy because every chance there was an ability for Jinx to heal, it was cut short or was cruelly poorly timed. I mean, come on, he could have really chosen another time to say that he loved her. Anyway, but you can't help but grieve for Powder's death over and over and over. So, I suppose the best way to refocus on why this show is Jinx's tragedy is by talking about Jinx herself as a character. I mentioned in the first section that Jinx was someone whose trauma was unable to heal, and part of that was engendered in the second episode. It's established that Powder was constantly set on a path to fail, because no matter how hard she tried to contribute, it would always fall short in everyone else's eyes. And she was always too small to throw hooks like Clagger and Vi, and she wasn't the one to open up locks. As such, everyone else looked down on her. Everyone except for Vi. So, you can see that Powder took risks and pushed herself even harder whenever the approval of Vi was on the line, and for the most part, Vi was always willing to give that approval. 
Even after Powder dropped those goods in the water, Vi forgave her when the others wouldn't. And even after Milo degraded Powder's shortcomings, Vi came to her defense. The only thing Powder knew she had a shot of doing to contribute to her family were to make the little bombs and trinkets that she could make. However, with Vander's capture and the memory of the hex crystals, Powder saw an opportunity to make it up to her family. Even when left behind, she figured out a way for her shortcomings to finally do anything but fall flat. Yet, it did too much. It placed blood on her hands. And when that happened, she and Vi lost everything in their world, and Vi at that moment couldn't come to her defense anymore. Two dead kids and one dead father is not something uh, that anyone can swallow easily and face with a stern face. I mean, much less someone as young as Vi. So when Vi called her a jinx and expressed her honestly understandable frustration, Powder knew that she had failed in the worst way possible. It exacerbated her already existing issue with feeling like she was never good enough to keep up with the rest of her family. I mean, come on, the last person that she thought that would have given up on her had somewhat given up on her in that moment. It only really gets worse from there, with Silco putting into Jinx's mind that everyone had betrayed her and that she was not necessarily at fault. Jinx was pushed further into violence and her traumatized way of viewing things was skewed even further. Because of the way that Silco tried to frame it, Jinx was absolved. Yet at the core of her being, Jinx knew that what had happened was wrong, but trying to reconcile the truth that Jinx was always enough, she just needed to be treated fairly, with the lies that Silco gave her, much less the horrible memory of that evening, Jinx could only really just get worse. I mean, that feeling of not being enough doesn't up and go away because Silco planted those ideas of absolution in her head, because like I said, those insecurities were instilled at a very young age and were only cemented by the deaths of Clagger, Milo and Vander. I I'm sure it's why she hears Clagger and especially Milo speak to her in her hallucinations. But back to what I was saying. Her feelings of inferiority can't go away with a snap of her fingers. It's why she's so bombastic with everything that she does, and it's why she steals the hex crystal, and it's why she finishes fish bones. The only person who could give her a semblance of approval was once five, but now Soko. And I think it's also why she was so desperate to get Caitlyn out of the picture once she had recognized how much she meant to Vi. As much as Jinx didn't want to disappoint Silco, his words about her supposed innocence and the betterment of Zahn were nothing to the old comfort that Powder had from Vi. Because Vi was the beginning and end of Jinx's true comfort. If Caitlyn was there, then what use would Vi ever have for Jinx? If Caitlyn was there, how could Jinx ever hope to be loved by the sister dating an enforcer literally hunting her down for murder? If Caitlyn was there, Vi had no choice but to betray Jinx, just as she was taught. Of course, I don't believe this is true. I believe Vi is capable of giving plenty of love out to those she loves platonically and romantically. However, I just want to emphasize that the culmination of trauma and the ideas planted into Jinx's mind is what leads her to think in this way, and it's why her actions are so violent and so over the top. No one can excuse it, but the forces that push Jinx into this position are so difficult for Jinx to overcome simply because she meets Vi after years of essentially being alone, so you can't expect her to just kind of flip, you know? I mean, all these variables are why it is only when Jinx finds that Vi cannot kill Caitlyn, and when Jinx kills Silco, that she does the last and worst thing she could do. She jinxes everything, just like she did all those years ago, in an attempt to make it up to the people that she loved. Back then, it was her family, and now it was the dead man she saw as her father. Jinx knew that even if Silco couldn't see the fruition of his labor, Jinx could try to see it through and accepting that she was alone again, and that Vi couldn't be that stable reassurance that she was all those years ago, is what pushed her to pull the trigger, to fulfill those words that Silco once spoke. Oh,